Turmoil in Thailand. The fine demonstrators demand the Prime Minister steps down and for the monarchy to be reformed. But will their cries for change be accepted or prosecuted? I'm Ali Aslan and today's newsmaker is Thailand's anti-government protest movement. They've been told their protests are illegal, but tens of thousands of people in Thailand don't care, ignoring the ban and risking it all for reform. The country has seen demonstrations before, but rarely have they targeted the untouchable monarchy. After all, insulting the king can lend you a hefty prison sentence. So why are protesters making this bold stand now? And not just against the monarchy, but the government too. Each day, calls for the Prime Minister to resign are getting louder, but he's standing firm, defiantly telling all he won't quit. So, who's going to break first, the protesters or the establishment? We'll discuss that in a moment, but first, Natalie Pahonen has this report. Gatherings like this are banned in Bangkok. But Thailand's youth will not be silenced. We believe we can win, but the government needs to listen to our voice the first. I don't think that by coming here today the monarchy would end in my generation, but at least we could try bringing them back under the democratic system, under the constitution. Thailand has experienced political unrest before, but the faces at these anti-government protests are new. These are youth-led demonstrations, and they've become a force to be reckoned with. They have three main demands. They're calling for a new constitution to replace the current one drafted by the military. They want the removal of Prime Minister and former coup leader Praya Chanocha and his government, and most controversially, reform of the monarchy. The government tried to bring an end to these protests by declaring a state of emergency and arresting several prominent pro-democracy activists. It hasn't worked. The three-finger salute, a sign of defiance adopted from the Hunger Games movies, continues to be raised at every protest. But there is a line the PM won't allow to be crossed. My duty and everyone's duty is to protect and eradicate all the ill intentions towards the kingdom. We cannot let the attempts to instigate or create unrest, disunity and chaos in the country happen. The calls for greater democracy had been building for months. But there was a distinct shift in August when a long-held taboo in Thailand was broken. Students publicly criticised King Maha Wadiralongkorn. They issued a list of demands including that the monarchy stays out of politics. It was a move made all the more remarkable given the Les Majestés law that prohibits insulting or defaming the royal family. It's a crime that carries a sentence of up to 15 years jail. In the past, that's quashed debate and criticism. The king is at the apex of the nation's political power. Since ascending the throne in 2016, he's placed two army units under his direct command and taken personal control of the royal family's wealth portfolio, estimated to be worth about $40 billion. The king has spent most of this year outside Thailand, with long stretches in Germany. But he's back now. Many Thais consider themselves devout royalists, so the demands of protesters to reduce the king's powers have created a generational divide. These demonstrations are not just a threat to the establishment, but also a challenge to traditional society. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, let's go to the Thai capital now, where I am joined by former Foreign Minister Kassit Piromia. He was also a yellow shirt activist and a politician with the Democrat Party.
James Buchanan is a visiting lecturer at Mahidol University and a researcher in Thai politics. And Titinan Pongsudirak is the director of the Institute of Security and International Studies in Bangkok. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Kasit, uh, Thailand has seen its fair share of political protests in the past, but this time it seems to be different, no? The magnitude, the depth, the substance uh, and the longevity of these protests seem to have a different kind of quality. Would you agree? Yes, and I agree in the sense that uh, there is a perception at the moment among many Thais and especially the young generation that they, the perception is that the military and the institution of the monarchy are one and the same. And so far, for the past six, seven years, with so much of the military intervention in politics to this very day, the performance of the military-led government has not been successful. And in that sense, uh, they have attacked the military, the prime minister, who is a former general, and when he did not move at all, then I think the anger and the discontentment uh, move on up the ladder to the very personality of His Majesty the King. The discontentment certainly is uh, vivid and uh, visual every day on the street, uh, James. Uh, we just saw in the package what the demonstrators want first and foremost. They want the removal of the Prime Minister and they want to reform, they want to see a reform of the monarchy and the constitution. Quite an ambitious package they've laid out there, no? Yeah, it is ambitious. In fact, I would say that it even goes even further than what you said. Um, aside from the broad political reforms that they would like to see, which include um, reforms of the monarchy, I would say this goes to a much deeper level that the younger generation would all also like to see um, sweeping changes of Thai society in general, um, which includes everything from um, the education system all the way up to the monarchy. So very, very deep, not only political, but social change also. Social change, uh, Titinan. If, if we look at uh, what the government is throwing at these demonstrators, uh, they're banning large gatherings, they're suspending public transportation, declaring a state of emergency, yet the protesters define every single ban that is being thrown at them. A very youthful, -led, a student-led uh, protest, as James has already pointed out. Uh, how did this all get started? Well, you know, we um, can point to a number of uh, turning points. I think the most immediate catalyst would have been the, the dissolution of the third largest winning party after the March 19, 2019 election last year. That was the Future Forward Party. The Future Forward Party represented and stood for an agenda of younger generations. You know, this was a an anti-military, military reforms, a very reform-oriented, reform-driven agenda that uh, resonated with a lot of first-time voters, a lot of younger generations. We're talking about people, uh, Ali, people that were born in 1980 and afterwards. These are the millennials, Gen Y, and then also the Gen Z, uh, people who have come of age in, in, in recent, uh, in the last couple of decades. They've seen crises and coups in Thailand. They've seen elections, they've seen constitutions. And then I think the last six years, they've seen military government running Thailand to the ground. So when there was a there was a you know there was an election based on a military inspired constitution, they put up with it until their party was dissolved. So the immediate catalyst was the dissolution of Future Forward Party. But there are other reasons, of course, other contributing factors. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, persecution, harassment, intimidation, human rights violations, um, you know, poor, abysmal uh, performance, mismanagement, misrule, incompetence. Um, and also, of course, corruption and nepotism. So at some point, they just basically said, you know, enough is enough, and they've taken matters into their own hands. Kasit, uh, do you sympathize with the student-led protests? Uh, you, you see what they want, uh, you see their demands, you hear them loud and clear. Is that something that you can get behind? I can understand, I can understand very well, because I have been also fighting for the reform of Thailand. I was one who voted and said it publicly, you know, to, to the Thai public that I was against the constitution. And I have opted out of politics because I don't want to be involved in politics under the present constitution. I also resigned from the Democrat Party, which joined the coalition. So I think I, I can sympathize, I can understand 
the wishes and the aspiration of the youth and so on. As I agree with Dr. Titinan, we have been a sort of a, a sick man of Southeast Asia for so long because the in, incompetency of the authorities and so on, you know, and they have not heeded to the call. It's not only the youth. You know, a lot of people like me, the silent majority, the middle class, the more liberal people and so on, have been asking for the same thing, except that we did not go on to the street for change. You know, we have said so many times to the Prime Minister, General Prayut, that he's uh, coming into prime ministership for the second time is illegitimate. And he did not respond to the demands and so on. And he's surrounded, as Dr. Titenan said, you know, by very, very bad people, you know, old style, traditional, corrupted politicians, instead of cleaning the whole cabinet and the running of the government. So, so on top of that, the discontentment of the youth, because they don't see that they will have a future under the present structure that has been in existence for decades. So clearly you share the uh, disillusionment on the part of the young people on the streets with Thai politics as usual. But Sir James, the removal of the prime minister and the political leaders, one thing. What makes these protests perhaps so special is that the monarchy itself is no longer immune from criticism. Quite on the contrary, the Queen's motorcade was confronted by demonstrators, something I unforeseen up until recently, and that in a country where criticizing the monarchy and the king is punishable up to 15 years in prison. Um, yes, I was going to say that um, th this doesn't really surprise me in a way, because I've been observing this growing anti-monarchy sentiment, which um, has been occurring in Thailand. Um, uh, going back to um, the red and yellow shirt crisis, uh, which began in 2005. And um, it was then that you started to see um, the first mur murmurings, the early stages of anti-monarchy sentiment, which was felt by the red shirts because of a, a perceived interference in, um, in politics by the monarchy, which at that time was during the reign of uh, King Rama IX. Um, and this grew throughout the twilight of uh, the reign of Rama Nine, and um, has now, I would say, just exploded uh, after the succession um, when King Rama X took the throne, um, especially due to some of the eccentricities and um, some of his um, more controversial behaviour. For example, as you mentioned in the lead-in, um, not even spending most of his time in Thailand and residing in Germany. Kasi, this is uh, interesting indeed. The, the Thai king, he more or less rules from abroad, spends most of his time in uh, Bavaria, in Germany, uh, broke with custom by intervening in Thai politics, uh, took personal command of all military units based in Bangkok, and as we heard, declared the crown wealth as his personal uh, property. How much of the fury, how much of the anger of the people on the street is directed towards him personally? Uh, 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 very much so, because I think the words that being said on the stage at the rallies were very direct, uh, a bit very bad language. But I think that uh, I think reflect the sentiments. But let let me say this: that uh, we have had uh, constitutional monarchy for eighty nine years. O only two kings of the past, and the the, king, the present king is the third. Then the second king, King Rama the ninth, he reigned for. 70 years, and in spite of certain interpretation whether how much he has intervened in politics at times and so on, he was a very righteous king, and most of the time he plays by the rule, and he was a very democratic one. And so 70 years of King Rama the ninth, you know, and then the people has uh, said him he's the great king. They have given him that title. And now the past three years of the present king, that is always the comparison you know, in the minds and in the heart of all the Thai people. But whether they express it openly is another thing. So you have seen the King Rama the Ninth, the father of the present king, very righteous, very religious, spent most of the times, you know, visiting the, the people when he was still uh, uh, in good health. But he introduced so many of development projects and so on. He was the king of the people. And now his son, people could 
see the difference uh, or the differences right away, not physically present in the country. And I, as I, I think uh, a sort of a more interventive in the affairs of the state or even the personal or the wealth of the of the dynasty. I think it's the, the, the takeover to come under himself alone uh, could could have uh, could have should have received more explanation. I think the Royal Palace should have explained why so and how the money is being used and so on, how much for the public goods and so on. You know that that is going to be something wrong with it, but I think the transparency, the clarity and the explanation to the people is very much needed. And a lot of the reforms demand by the youth, it's about communication, transparency and accountability, which is not beyond you know, the institution of the monarchy and it's not beyond the institution of the government, namely the prime minister, to come out and explain to the people. But for the past few months, all the demands of the youth have not been met by any positive, concrete, and I think reasonable response. The only thing that we see is the demand for the use of, for the for, for the respect of the law. But at the same time, there is this so-called weaponization of the law by the authorities, and right. that increases yeah, the, the anger. Right. Uh, Titanan, what we're seeing right now in Thailand is a bit of a showdown, a standoff between the government and the protesters, uh, uh, seeing who's going to blink first here. Um, how do you think this is going to play out? Well, we obviously, as you said, um, Ali, you know, we're seeing a kind of a, a brinkmanship uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the protesters, student-led protest movement is uh, upping their game. Uh, the government is coming back with emergency decree and uh, a bit of a dispersal and then now uh, trying to figure out what to do next. So th this kind of uh, back and forth, back and forth, I think uh, makes the situation uh, you know, very tense, of course, very confrontational, but also untenable. At some point, something will have to give. Uh, the demands are very clear and, and they actually are huge demands. But the, the, the one that I think would be the minimal one, the one that is most uh, practicable, workable, would be the resignation of the prime minister. But the student-led protest movement also has to spell out what they see as a, as a post prayut scenario, what kind of a prime minister would be the interim leader of Thailand. And then, you know, they would have to talk about the constitution drafting process if they want to have a new constitution, and then reform of the monarchy within that constitution. This is a very tall, daunting order, mm -hmm. uphill task. But I think at the minimum, uh, we, you know, General Payut now is the, is the problem. And somehow, um, if that doesn't give, uh, then we will have ten tension leading to confrontation and, and most likely some turmoil because springmanship is going to go on and on and it cannot go on uh, for too long, indefinitely. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and so we, we see in Nigeria, for instance, these days, how that can play out, certainly not in a positive uh, way, James. Uh, Thai politics is uh, rarely ever it, it makes international headlines. It is making now. Uh, the international community is paying attention to what is taking place in Thailand. How much does international pressure and attention play a role here in these demonstrations? Um, I think it's very important for the protesters, especially the young protesters who see themselves as global citizens nowadays, um, to, to be seen. Um, for the international community um, to bear witness and for international organizations, NGOs, Amnesty International, etc., um, to, to pay attention to what's going on and to lend whatever um, support is possible and appropriate. What, what kind of outcome would you like to see, James? And what kind of outcome you think is realistic under the given circumstances? Uh, Dr. Titinan uh, just said that the bare minimum would be for the um, for General Prayut to step down. Um, I think um, that would not be enough. I think, as we said at the start of the discussion, that the protesters would like to see um, a complete restructuring of the Thai um, political order. And that does not mean the kind of reforms which were um, initiated after the last coup, which the last uh, social movement um, in 2013 and 2014, which was a royal nationalist movement um, and an anti-democratic movement, that does not mean the kind of reforms that um, that they were looking for, um, but rather actual meaningful reforms which would bring in finally a period of representative democracy 
and an end to the undemocratic interference of Thai politics by institutions like the monarchy, like the military, um, which um, has always been a problem in Thailand. Kasset, you already said that you share uh, the uh, dreams and, and the protests and the disillusionment on the part of the protesters said, uh, I harbored them as well, but our generation did not go out and demonstrate the way this new generation does. What, the, what distinguishes them? Why, why do you think this generation is now so active, so vocal and so defiant in the way they go about these protests? Well, I, I tend to disagree on the say that the, the older generation did not. I, when I was younger, I was part of the protest, you know, and the successive generations, you know, uh, since the 1960s and 1970s and 80s and 90s, we did have the youth coming out to protest more or less against the military authoritarian. Right, but, but, but you but also this said time, this is at a different magnitude, right? A different quality this yeah, time. Yes, it, it's, it's, it's a different quality in the sense that now, with the advent of the telecommunication technology, the social media, and so on. So uh, there is a more knowledgeable, knowledgeable youth. And then uh, they are much more aware of the social use and political use of the society. And I think they think more about, uh, about their future, you know, so, in, uh, so the different, and then as Dr. Titinan said, and so on, they want a sort of a total transformation of the Thai society. Before we were protesting against authoritarian government demand for democracy, but this time I think the fundamental, a very fundamental change, uh, demand is for a total transformation of Thailand to make it fully democratic, uh, open, you know, decentralization, military back into the barracks, and never to see the military in politics again. Titinan. Uh... This conflict, as I said, but, or these protests are being watched closely by the international community, but certainly by Thailand's neighbors. Do you think this potentially could even have a trickle-down effect, a contagious effect on some of Thailand's neighbors? Up to a point, um, Ali, I think that it's important for your viewers to know that, uh, that the nature of conflict and confrontation in Thailand this time is fundamentally different. In the past, you have to understand that we had one king for seven decades. And I would say that in the first five decades of that reign, the last reign, the ninth reign of the, of the ninth king of this dynasty were, you know, were the years of the Cold War. It was an anti-communist movement, uh, similar to Turkey in some ways. So you have, to, you have to know that for Thailand, the established political order was built during the Cold War, revolving around the military, the monarchy, the bureaucracy, the judiciary. This is the old established order, the established centers of power. But now they're facing challenges over the last two decades, I think because of technology, uh, younger demographics, but also, you know, the contagious effect of uh, seeing the world moving on and Thailand falling behind. And I have to say the, the mismanagement and misrule of the military government since the coup in 2014. So these young people now, they want to reclaim their future. If you look at their speeches, they talk about the future a lot because they've got no future because Thailand has no future. So, you know, for Thailand, um, Ali, you know, 30 years ago, uh, in the late 1990s, Thailand was the, the bastion of democratization in the developing world. It was an example, um, but then it kind of got derailed and, and uh, distracted. And of course, uh, we're seeing now all kinds of problems with uh, autocracy, authoritarian rule. So I think that the neighborhood uh, is a mixed bag. Of course, uh, Thailand used to lead the way, but now it's really the laggard. Uh, economic performance very poor. Um, you know, so Thailand, in terms of reversal, has gone far, far back. But uh, there's hope ahead because I think now the established order has to answer, has to become answerable to these new voices, younger voices that are rising up. Um, it's, it's really a, gut, a gutted kind of a wrenching process, Ali, for Thai people. Right. Because on the one hand, we want to have change, but we also need to maintain some continuity. So let's hope we have some concession and some compromise. That's what we're looking for. Accountability versus a political compromise and hopefully a peaceful solution. James, before we wrap up, the authorities are thrown much, uh, everything they have at these protesters, yet they define every single ban out there and keep protesting. This will continue for a while, no? Um, I'm absolutely sure it will. But just a quick point that the, pro the authorities have not thrown everything that they have at the protesters yet, because we know very well from recent Thai history that um, uh, the um, 
the elites in Thailand are not afraid to use the military as they did in 2010 when they cracked down against the red shirts and when the military come that the crackdown can often be quite brutal indeed. Um, so we certainly haven't seen the last of the protests and I certainly hope that uh, this time there will be a more um, peaceful, non-violent solution um, to the crisis. James Buchanan, Kasi Piromia and Titinan Pongsudirak, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for providing insight and context to the current protests in Thailand. And thank you out there for watching, of course. Hope to see you again next time when we're back with a new edition of Newsmakers.